Good afternoon, everyone. This is Bridget Policine of the IIB. We want to welcome everyone to um, our second session of um, the uh, kind of a deep down, deep dive <laughs> on the Federal Reserve facilities and what foreign banks need to know. Again, we're very grateful to Rena Sani and Tim Byrne at Sherman and Sterling for putting together this presentation. Um, we got rave reviews of last week's program. And I think uh, people especially appreciate that you all were so focused on some of the special challenges or issues that the foreign bank communities um, face or might be interested in in these various facilities. So we really appreciate that. Um, I think, Rena, you're going to kind of walk us through how to proceed again, but I'll mention that last time we got a lot of questions during the course of the presentation, and that was really helpful um, either to be addressed during the presentation or follow up later. So again, encourage that. It's the best way to make sure that this is useful to all of you. And really, Rena and Tim, thank you again for taking the time to do this. You're great partners to the IIB and we all appreciate it. So with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Bridget. Um, and thank you again to the IAB for hosting us. Uh, as Bridget mentioned, this is Rena Sani at Sherman and Sterling, and I'm joined by my colleague, Tim Byrne. So first and foremost, we hope everyone on the call is safe and in good health, um, and as much as possible, keeping their spirits up in these uh, challenging times. So we appreciate the opportunity to continue the dialogue that we began with our last webinar, um, as Bridget mentioned, about the actions that the Federal Reserve has taken in response to the pandemic and talk about their lending facilities in particular. Um, we also had a number of questions that came up after the last webinar, and so we want to take the opportunity to answer some of those questions here as we're going through the presentation. Just to lay out the agenda for our call, our intention is to talk about the Fed's most recently announced actions, including the Main Street facilities and some of the more notable aspects of those programs. We've been receiving a number of questions on the ability of foreign banks to participate in those programs through their U.S. branches and subsidiaries, and we'll address those questions as we discuss the programs. Uh, we'll mention a few of the issues that have come up in the Paycheck Protection Program in particular, sort of as a point of comparison as we go through these Fed programs. It's obviously a very different program from what the Fed is putting in place, but I think it's a helpful sort of counterpoint when thinking about some of the issues that do or may arise under the Fed facilities. Um, we'll mention also some of the disclosure and oversight questions that have been coming up in the context of these programs. Um, and finally, uh, time permitting, we'll, we've noted additional actions that the, Fed, the federal uh, banking regulators and state banking regulators have taken since we've last presented uh, that relate to the pandemic. As Bridget mentioned, there is an ability for participants to ask questions through the Q&A function, um, and so I encourage people to use that. Um, we'll be able to see the questions as we move through the presentation, but we'll also leave time for questions at the end. Um, so that will make this, as Bridget said, sort of hopefully more uh, interactive and more um, uh, useful to, to the audience. So with that, I'll dive right in. Um, we continue to see the government's regulatory response to the pandemic as sort of a three-legged stool, if you will. The CARES Act and related stimulus programs, the banking regulators response through guidance to financial institutions, and the Fed's emergency lending programs. On this last point, what we saw about two weeks ago now is that the Fed has supplemented its previously announced programs by adding additional facilities, as well as upsizing uh, certain existing facilities. So in particular, the Fed announced the Paycheck Protection Program Lending Facility, which will allow the Fed to lend on a non-recourse basis against PPP loans made by depository institutions, which is currently close to $350 billion in loans funded. 
Uh, the Fed announced a municipal liquidity facility, which is expected to offer $500 billion in funding to cities, states, and counties. And the Fed announced the Main Street facilities, which are expected to purchase up to $600 billion in loans. In addition, the Fed expanded the size and scope of three existing facilities, the primary market corporate credit facility, which was increased from $10 billion in initial funding to $50 billion, the secondary market corporate credit facility, which was increased from $10 billion in initial funding to $25 billion, and the term asset backed securities loan facility, or TALP, as to which the range of eligible collateral has been broadened. So the combined lending by the Fed of, under the three programs is expected to be uh, close to $850 billion. When combined with the lending expected under the four new facilities, this um, sort of adds up to an expected $2.3 trillion in lending and purchasing power by the Fed. Um, the Treasury is funding the facilities with up to $195 billion in funding, suggesting that over $250 billion of the $454 billion authorized under the CARES Act is still available for future facilities or upsizing of the existing facilities. So all of this is to sort of underscore the point um, that you know the issues that we discuss, including the scope of the programs and the eligible participants in the programs, are um, of you know some some importance. Um, so just flipping to uh, the next slide, JL. I guess the chart in the slide summarizes some of the key terms in the facilities. Um, so we thought we would start with the newly announced facilities that's the Main Street programs, and then circle back to changes in the existing facilities. We won't go sort of, you know, item by item under each facilities, but really want to highlight some of the, the key aspects that are likely to be of interest to this audience. So maybe with that, Tim, can I ask you to talk about the Main Street program and some of the more notable aspects of that program? Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, thanks, Rena. Um, and uh, thanks everyone for having us. Um, so we're at about page 11, uh, and 12 of the uh, the slides that um, and then the following pages but um, I think the best place to start is the uh, Main Street facilities and these uh, these basically supplement the PPP loans um, by supporting uh, basically four-year term loans uh, to companies with up to 10,000 employees or up to 2.5 billion in uh, 2019 annual revenues. Uh, so an, an eligible borrower um, uh, may only participate in one of the, and then it's the, you know, the, main, the, the main street, there's the new loan facility, MS and LF, then there's the main street um, expanded loan facility um, which is um, basically uh, upsizing, you know, an existing loan. Um, but an eligible borrower uh, may participate in only one of the MSNLF, MSELF, or the primary market corporate credit facility. Um, however, the Fed has clarified that an eligible borrower uh, can participate in a Main Street facility um, and the Paycheck uh, Protection. Um, program, um, which implies that companies with less than 500 employees or fewer than 500 employees can participate in the uh, Main Street facilities. So broadly speaking, the mechanics of the program uh, are, uh, again, similar to several of the other programs that have been set up. Uh, there is a special purpose vehicle, an SPV, that is funded by Treasury um, and then supported by the Fed uh, through lending, uh, where that SPV will purchase a 95% uh, participation in an eligible loan, um, or in the case of if it's the expanded loan facility, you know, a 95% participation in the upsized tranche of an eligible loan, uh, basically purchase at par value from eligible lenders. Um, the eligible lender would retain 5% of each eligible loan or upsized uh, tranche. Um, then uh, with all these facilities, you know, we have to pay attention because each participant sort of has a, a definition. Uh, and as you know, the, the, the definitions can evolve and, the, and raise various issues, especially for the internationally active banks. 
but an eligible borrower is one that must be a business that is created or organized in the United States or under the laws of the United States with significant operations in and a majority of its employees based in the United States. And eligible lenders under the program are US deposit, insured depository institutions, US bank holding companies, uh, US savings and loan holding companies. So the relevant term sheets do not specifically state that a US branch of a foreign banking organization uh, would be an eligible lender. And we know that this is you know, one of the areas uh, that is uh, subject to sort of ongoing advocacy um, uh, by the IIB uh, to confirm that US branches um, of the non-US banks can also be eligible lenders under the program and thus, uh, and sell participations to the facility. Uh, you know, which makes sort of total sense because there's you know an eligible borrower requirement, so we know where the funds are ultimately uh, going. As you know, a, a lot of these programs, you know, there's always sort of looking for the the U.S. centric uh, part of it, sort of the America first part of it. Um, but it, it, you know, in this context, it it would make uh, perfect sense for the U.S. branches uh, of the foreign banks to be eligible lenders. Um, in this program, uh, there is no uh, loan forgiveness as there is in the PPP. Um, but uh, the uh, amortization of principal and interest can be uh, deferred uh, for one year. Uh, so uh, we don't propose to go through, there's a lot to cover, uh, to go through all of the terms in detail. Um, but you know, one of the items that has uh, raised a number of issues and questions you know, is how the size of loans will be calculated and the metrics uh, used is currently the minimum size of the loans is a million, um, but the maximum is calculated based on um, uh, the borrower's EBITDA. And uh, this has raised a number of questions about how that's going to be calculated for this person, or for this purpose, how it can work uh, in the context of um, borrowers that may not have, um, you know, straightforward uh, EBITDA uh, calculations. Great, thanks, Tim. So um, I think one of the interesting things about the Main Street programs and likely you know, sort of impactful in terms of its uptake is that because the program and these facilities are deemed to be direct loans under the CARES Act, certain compensation, stock repurchase, and capital distribution restrictions apply per the statute. Um, can you talk a little bit about those considerations, particularly in the context of a potential um, borrower that's a U.S. subsidiary of a foreign parent company? Yes, so uh, yeah, the restrictions that uh, come up. So you have restrictions on repurchasing equity securities listed on a national secur securities exchange, and how that applies uh, to a parent company um, of an eligible business. You have likewise, you have restrictions on capital distributions that um, you know, don't make a, you know, those restrictions don't make a distinction based on dividends that would be paid to a parent company and those that are paid by <clears throat> public companies to their public shareholders. Um, and those <clears throat> restrictions apply for 12 months after the date that the loan is no longer outstanding. Uh, finally, to the extent a parent company officer or employee is also an officer or employee of the US borrower, the compensation restrictions would apply to those individuals. Uh, the Fed has indicated that it uh, was accepting comments uh, on this um, and other facilities. We're waiting to see how that was until April 16th, I think. We're waiting to see how the Fed responds to the comments it has received, including uh, uh, li likely FAQs um, and other documents. Again, with these various programs, there's different documents out there, right? There's um, there's term sheets. Uh, there's Q and A's, um, sample documents, 
things like that. So, um, and, and those get updated periodically. So we're looking to see how the FAQs come out. Um, but among other comments that have been raised, you know, it's, you know, to what extent the Fed will purchase, you know, all loans that meet the eligibility criteria or whether there will be additional considerations as to which loans to purchase, you know, what will be reasonable for lenders to rely upon in the required attestations from borrowers. Like the attestation includes that the borrower requires the financing due to exigent circumstances uh, and that the borrower will make reasonable efforts to use the proceeds of the loan to maintain payroll um, and retain employees. And then, um, you know, what the recourse to the lender and seller will be, um, if at all, it, it, you know, if any, if the borrower violates the uh, ongoing um, representations. Great. Thanks, Tim. Um, so let me check and see uh, before we move on to discuss some of the other facilities, whether there are any questions that have come up so far. I guess one question we've gotten is whether the Fed will release daily updates on total market participation in each of the facilities. Um, that's a that's a really good question. So what the Fed has indicated, at least for some of the facilities, and I don't think that they've been explicit on this point for the Main Street facilities. Oh, well, I should take that back for a minute. On some of the facilities, they have indicated that they're going to provide weekly updates on aggregate um, activity under the facilities. I think that's uh, true with respect to the primary and secondary corporate credit facilities, for example. Um, I think they've also indicated, again, with respect to some of the facilities, um, including uh, with respect to the primary and secondary uh, corporate credit facilities that they'll um, disclose information about uh, participants, transaction amounts, um, costs, and fees, um, but they haven't uh, applied that, you know, sort of uh, or indicated that same um, disclosure is going to apply across the board to all the facilities. Um, Great. Uh, so I think just moving on then, um, it's probably worth pivoting to talk a little bit about the Paycheck Protection Program uh, lending facility in particular. Uh, Tim mentioned that was among uh, the, um, the uh, items that, uh, that have come, that it's come up. Um, here, there's been a threshold question under the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, itself about whether U.S. branches of foreign banks are insured depository institutions and therefore automatically qualify to make loans under the PPP or, or whether they have to qualify as sort of a third category of lender for which approval is required from the SBA. Um, the Paycheck Protection Program lending facility is effectively there to allow the Fed to um, uh, lend against the PPP loans to uh, depository institutions that are eligible lenders on a non-recourse basis. So it, it, it sort of, you know, gives the um, lenders a backstop for those loans. Uh, and then the maturity and reimbursement of the, the facility loans tied to uh, the SBA guarantee under uh, with respect to the underlying PPP loan. Um, so it you know, currently, as I mentioned, the, the PPP uh, lending facility of the Fed is um, tied to eligible lenders under the PPP, um, and, including depository institutions, and the Fed's indicated that it's looking to expand eligibility um, to other lenders uh, under the PPP in the future. Um, but so far, uh, the, the banking agencies have also sort of been supporting the PPP by issuing an interim final rule to allow banks to assign a zero risk percent risk weight to the PPP loans if they're pledged to the, to the lending facility. Um, you know, as I'm sure many people have seen in the news, there's talk about expanding the, the PPP. It was originally funded up to 350 billion. Um, now it's uh, that's all been lent out, and there's talk of uh, adding an additional 380 billion. Um, that's you know making its way through Congress, uh, and if that happens, then you know we may well expect the uh, PPP lending facility to expand its lending uh, capacity as well. Um, I, I, I thought one of the interesting things that may be, you know, relevant again to this audience is that, you know, some of the statistics coming out on the PPP indicate that 
you know, sort of smaller regional banks are, are disproportionately represented among the participants as lenders in the program, which reflect the importance of existing banking relationships in originating those loans, which sort of underscores, as we were saying earlier, uh, the importance um, of, uh, you know, the U.S. branches of the uh, non-U.S. banks to be lenders under the program to allow their customers to take advantage of it as well. Um, finally, among the new facilities that have been announced is the municipal liquidity facility. Um, and under that facility, uh, the SPV established by the Fed will basically purchase eligible notes directly from eligible issuers, which includes states, cities, and counties subject to um, the Fed's review and approval. I, I won't uh, say much more about this one other than to note that the um, municipal liquidity facility will be funded initially with $35 billion from Treasury, which is expected um, to support uh, upwards of $500 billion of purchases by the SPV. Um, but this is another area where uh, I expect that you know, we may see additional activity in the future as um, sort of the uh, situation of the municipalities and states um, uh, become increasingly um, an area of focus. Uh, so with that, um, Tim, maybe you can speak a bit about the primary and secondary corporate credit facilities. Yes. So in addition to the new facilities that were announced, um, which we've been talking about, the Fed has expanded the primary and secondary uh, corporate credit facilities. So indicating that both will be funded with uh, $75 billion, um, by Treasury, which is expected to support about Six hundred uh, billion in uh, new lending and um, purchases, uh, you know, secondary market purchases of uh, of debt. So, in both cases, eligible issuers are businesses that, again, are created or organized in the United States or under the laws of the United States, with significant operations in and a majority of its employees in the United States. So there is no indication that these uh, issuers, so borrowers, uh, cannot be uh, U.S. subsidiaries of non-U.S. companies, uh, you know, assuming the borrower otherwise meets the eligibility uh, criteria. Um, and those eligibility criteria include, um, you know, basically being, uh, you know, a rated uh, issuer. Uh, Insured depository institutions and depository institution holding companies um, are not uh, eligible borrowers um, in the programs. So in the case of the uh, primary market uh, corporate credit facility, uh, the SPV, again, this is the SPV that Treasury funds and that the Fed lends to, so it's essentially the Fed. Uh, the SPV will purchase corporate bonds uh, either as the sole investor uh, in a bond issuance, uh, or it will it can be an eligible uh, syndicated loans or, or corporate bonds um, um, at issuance. So, can, so sometimes the, the SPV, the Fed, will be the only uh, buyer, and sometimes uh, it will be uh, one among several. So in the, uh, in the case of the secondary market corporate credit facility, uh, the SPV will purchase um, eligible individual corporate bonds as well as eligible ETFs, so exchange traded funds um, that basically hold debt. Uh, so it, the, the Fed will buy those from um, an eligible seller in the secondary market. So an eligible seller for this purpose is defined uh, using the U.S. organized or created standard uh, with significant operations in, in the U.S. and the majority of the employees in the U.S. Uh, this does not appear to be a requirement of the CARES Act, but even if it is, would not appear to limit the ability of U.S. branches or U.S. brokers, uh, dealer subsidiaries of non-U.S. banks uh, to be eligible uh, sellers. Um, but we note that um, this is one of the points um, you know, where the um, you know, Fed has been asked for uh, confirmation. Um, and then in the FAQs, um, so you know, the Fed has stated that the secondary market corporate credit facility will 
at first transact with uh, the primary dealers uh, that meet the eligible seller criteria, um, uh, which raises the question of whether both the primary dealers and the counterparties from which they source the corporate bonds and ETFs have to you know, meet the eligible seller criteria. Great, thanks, Tim. Um, I mean, I think the, the common theme that emerges in a number of these uh, points is that, you know, while the Fed has put out the term sheets for these facilities, you know, they're still, you know, as they would typically do, um, FAQs that are expected to be issued, as well as eventually program documents that, you know, will hopefully flush out uh, a number of these questions uh, that are still sort of outstanding or on which confirmation is needed. Um, so in addition to the new facilities and the updates to the primary and secondary corporate credit facilities, um, we note that the Fed in their most recent release has also made tweaks to the term sheet for the term asset-backed liquidity facility or TALF. Um, can you talk about those and, and again in particular how the changes are relevant for foreign banks? Yes, yeah, certainly. So with TALF, uh, a couple types of changes. So certain changes were made to the term sheet to expand the eligible collateral to include leverage loans and commercial mortgages. Uh, the term sheet also tweaked the definition of eligible borrowers. So this includes US companies with eligible collateral um, and that maintain an account uh, with a primary dealer. Now, the term sheet had previously been explicit that the definition includes a U.S. company with a non-U.S. parent and a U.S. branch or agency of, uh, of a foreign bank, of a non-U.S. bank. <clears throat> but this has been replaced with the same definition of U.S. company that ap appears in the, the CARES Act and in the other term sheets. Uh, so again, that's the, you know, the operations in the U.S., majority of employees in the U.S. Uh, so for the same reasons we've um, you know, discussed previously, we think that the definition should encompass the U.S. branches and U.S. subsidiaries um, of non-U.S. banks, uh, and moreover that this is consistent with the purpose of the facility. Um, and the, you know, the purpose of the facility is to support the markets for the eligible collateral, um, and that is, uh, I think, pretty clearly further supported by allowing you know, branches and subsidiaries to be borrowers in the facility, you know, providing the uh, requirements of the eligible collateral are met. Um, the collateral requirements include that the issuer, so the issuer of the eligible collateral is a U.S. company, um, that the credit um, exposures underlying the collateral uh, must have been um, originated by um, a U.S. company. And then, you know, in contrast, the commercial paper funding facility uh, still specifically allows for per, uh, for purchases of commercial paper from uh, U.S. issuers of commercial paper, um, including issuers with a, um, with a foreign, you know, non-U.S. Um, parent company. Great. Um, so let's pause there and see if there are any questions on the terms of these facilities and uh, you know anything around the eligibility for the facilities. Um, like I said, you know we haven't gone through sort of you know item by item on each of these and the uh, relevant terms. Those are summarized in the slides as well as in you know our and many other uh, client memos uh, that talk about that. The 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 particulars of the facilities, but we thought it was helpful to at least highlight, you know, some of these issues around um, borrow who can be borrowers and uh, who can be sellers under some of these facilities. Um, one of the questions we had received um, that came up in the last webinar, which we just wanted to circle back to, was whether um, there are collateral restrictions on loans that are executed by electronic signature. Um, which I think was a, a, a pretty interesting question. Um, and, and just on that one, the Fed ha, you know, has separately issued FAQs, uh, not so much in the context of these facilities, uh, but more generally that suggests that electronic signatures on collateral will be accepted. Um, so I think that's a helpful uh, piece of information uh, to extend people have that question. 
Um, I guess more uh, broadly, you know, uh, uh, you know, among the other questions that have come up, um, you know, again, first in the context of the PPP, and then more generally with respect to the 13-3 facilities, has been the level of disclosure and oversight um, over the facilities. Um, as you know, the uh, participants in the uh, webinar will have likely seen, the PPP has been under tremendous scrutiny with respect to who are the borrowers and who are the lenders on, under those programs. Um, so far, the SBA and Treasury have not disclosed individual borrower information. Uh, I think individual borrowers, particularly public companies, have uh, self-identified themselves as um, borrower, borrowers under the PPP, um, but SBA and Treasury do appear to have the authority and the ability to do so. And that's raised, you know, among other things, questions about, you know, who should be borrowers, um, reputational issues, um, as well as distinct from, you know, purely or technical questions about who can be borrowers under those programs. Um, on the Fed's facilities, the Fed has a statutory mandate to disclose information. Um, and as we had talked about on the last webinar, uh, as a general matter, that's intended to be on a delayed basis. Um, However, in the case of certain facilities, the Fed um, has indicated that it will modify that schedule. Um, so, you know, again, this came up in the question from earlier, uh, but um, the Fed has indicated that it will publicly disclose information regarding the primary market corporate credit facility and the secondary market corporate credit facility during the operation of the facility, including information regarding participants and transaction amounts, costs, revenues, and other fees. Um, the balance sheet items related to the SPV and the primary market corporate credit facility and secondary market corporate credit facility will, will be reported weekly, in each case on an aggregated basis on the H41 statistical release. Um, in addition, the Fed uh, does have an obligation to disclose information to Congress pursuant to Section 13.3, as well as uh, Regulation A and uh, the CARES Act. Um, so we, you know, we've already seen some of those reports by the Fed. They posted them on their website. As a general matter, um, so far, they tend to be pretty in line with the information in the term sheets themselves. Um, but uh, on a go forward basis, that you know may may become more detailed. Um, under the PPPLF, the Fed has only indicated so far that it will report total borrowing weekly on an aggregated basis. Um, and in fact, what we've seen is that they've already started to do that kind of reporting uh, in the case of the commercial paper funding facility where the, uh, the latest H41 report uh, shows aggregated commercial paper notes held of 950 million in face value. Um, I guess, again, sort of more broadly, we expect there, there will be you know, continuing public scrutiny and reporting, um, as well as the required oversight over the Fed facilities. Um, this will likely occur by the Special um, Inspector General, there's a Congressional Oversight Commission that's authorized by the CARES Act. The DOJ has indicated um, that they'll be uh, scrutinizing potential fraud in this area closely, and um, even you know, the uh, potential for uh, uh, key TAM suits brought by individuals. Um, I mean, we've already seen some litigation, as people might have, um, might have uh, seen in the news uh, with certain uh, borrowers uh, bringing suit against uh, certain banks for being uh, selective in their loans to borrowers under the PPP and alleging they had an obligation to, um, to review all borrowers uh, sort of um, on an on a equal basis. Um, that, suit, uh, that suit's been dismissed by the district court, um, but again, it highlights the potential for after the fact scrutiny and litigation related to these programs. Um, so let me pause there again to see if there are any questions. Uh, looks like none for right now. Uh, in that case, maybe Tim, if you can um, round things out a little bit by talking about some of the current regulatory guidance that has come out in particular since we last spoke both um, at the federal and at the state level. Yes, yeah, certainly. So I think the last time we spoke was early April, 
and uh, the regulators have been uh, busy uh, since that time, as has everyone. Uh, but a, a couple things, um, the, so some things um, more relevant than others, but for instance, uh, the community bank leverage ratio, uh, there's relief granted on that, that allows smaller banks not to have to um, you know, calculate uh, uh, capital and risk-based, under the risk-based capital standards if they meet a, a certain leverage ratio. Um, then uh, it was on April 7th, the, the agencies updated uh, the guidance on sort of working with uh, borrowers. Um, and the agencies had put out guidance um, March 22nd was the original. So that got updated uh, April 7th. And again, covering, um, you know, largely the same topics, you know, also uh, highlighting, um, you know, um, general safety and soundness considerations and consumer protection issues when dealing with consumers. But, um, but that's the guidance that, you know, among other things, um, even though it's not a, a capital regulation, it's not an interim rule or anything like that, there's guidance in that document that impacts um, uh, regulatory capital calculations. So that uh, if uh, a lender, you know, enters into forbearance with a borrower, that means that the borrower is not missing a contractual uh, due date. And so a loan doesn't end up going 90 days past due and that has capital implications. So there's, there's things like that um, in that guidance. Um, the, uh, another thing, uh, that we've seen in a couple of areas is um, extension of comment periods. So FDIC has extended comment, the comment period on um, its broker deposit uh, uh, rulemaking. And that was, so the notice extending it was published April 8th. The comment period is extended from April 10th to June 9th. Now Volcker rule, uh, the vocal rule comment period was essentially um, extended. Um, again, um, the regulators have issued, um, you know, interim regulations to that go uh, with the um, the Paycheck Protection Program that clarify how um, the risk-based capital and leverage uh, rules. Um, you know, apply to those loans. Um, April 14th, uh, relief was granted. Uh, the agencies um, granted relief on appraisal requirements um, for certain uh, residential and commercial real estate loans. So not a waiver, but, uh, but um, basically deferring uh, for up to 120 days after closing. Um, appraisal requirements and then, but not, not all loans are excluded. So you have to look because uh, transactions involving acquisition, development and construction of real estate are excluded from uh, the interim rule. Um, again, in connection with um, paycheck uh, protection, uh, this one just, well, it was announced uh, on the 17th. It was published in the Federal Register today a uh, certain relief under Reg O to allow uh, you know, shareholders, directors of banks um, to uh, obtain, you know, allow their businesses to um, obtain uh, loans under the Paycheck Protection uh, Program. Um, you know, another thing is just to keep an eye out for is, you know, these regulations are moving fast, being announced, uh, fast and so uh, you end up getting um, technical corrections um, so things um, you know may not be a big substantive difference but you just want to uh, you know you know stay aware of these things that you know even today uh, there was an announcement of um, you know technical technical correction of, to the uh, um, the interim final rule on the uh, 
I guess it's the Cecil, the, the, uh, the credit loss, the new uh, credit loss uh, methodology, uh, the current expected credit loss methodology. Um, so, you know, it's sort of uh, daily uh, occurrences. Um, and I think that, you know, there was also, huh, yeah, in addition to all the COVID specific things that are happening, it's also, you know, you don't want to lose sight of, you know, sort of other things going on. And, you know, for example, the um, FFIEC issued an update uh, to the BSA AML uh, exam manual. Uh, so that was, uh, I think, just, um, I think, a week ago today. Uh, so you want to keep your eye out uh, for those uh, for those things. Um, at the state level, also, so in New York, um, the uh, DFS um, has provided uh, relief, uh, basically, uh, you know, sort of annual meeting. Uh, type requirements in terms of uh, timing for um, when they need to be held. And then, uh, so basically uh, giving more time, and then also relief on um, how they are held. So basically allowing meetings to be held, you know, not in person, um, but as, you know, as long as everybody can, can hear everybody else, uh, that that will uh, basically count as a, um, you know, as an effective uh, meeting for you know, various provisions under the, uh, the New York uh, banking law. So I think those are the, I think those are the main updates over the last uh, few weeks. Great, thank you, Tim. I guess we have one question that came in about um, whether, are, you know, are you aware of any Fed action or to come on relief for tailoring risk-based indicators and use of emergency facilities? I'm not aware of um, anything specific, but it's a good point. It, 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 yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting point, but I'm not aware of anything um, specific in the works. Yeah. Hi, Rena. Yep. Hi, it's Stephanie from IAB. <laughs> um, I was just going to say that um, we have uh, been advocating uh, for this kind of relief, um, but also have not heard any, um, any feedback yet. Great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that update. Yeah. yeah, I guess, you know, we've, we've mentioned that under the Paycheck Protection Program liquidity facility, there's, you know, relief in terms of the risk weighting for those um, types of loans. But, um, but it, it'll be interesting to see what else the Fed may do on this front. Um, okay, well, I guess, you know, if uh, we don't have other questions coming in, maybe Tim, I'll, you know, um, ask you, you know, given where we are now, you know, what the Fed has put out um, and, you know, the fact that there are some, uh, you know, powder still dry in there, um, in the box, if you will, you know, what do you see as sort of the areas of focus you know, that maybe the areas of focus coming up or down the pike, um, you know, do you think it's continuing with the existing facilities and, up, you know, upsizing them, potential new facilities or areas of focus? I'd be curious for your views on that. Yes. The, well, no one knows uh, how the virus is going to progress, you know, how long the, the uh, social distancing measures will be in place, you know, what the you know, continuing, you know, how widespread and, uh, and for how long the economic impact will be. Um, but it, it seems that there could well be additional similar steps uh, taken for, um, you know, to provide additional stimulus and additional credit easing. Uh, I was watching, people may have seen the uh, press conference um, sort of at the end of the day yesterday uh, with Secretary Mnuchin and he was getting questions on sort of, and, and they were talking about the extension of the, um, the Paycheck Protection Program. And 
he was already getting questions on things like how, how is money to the states going to be allocated in terms of like infection rates in the states versus other factors. Uh, and, and his response is, it's way too early to talk about <laughs> those things. Uh, so it, it's, it seems like, uh, yeah, that the discussions are, are um, clearly underway uh, for you know, future actions. So we know that the municipalities and states are under enormous strain. Um, and while certain of the uh, certain of the current tools contemplate assistance to you know to municipalities and states, uh, we could see additional action uh, in these areas. Um, you know, in the uh, you know, separate issue in the last financial crisis, you know, as asset quality became an issue. Um, you know, although that was on a you know a different set of assets, different circumstances, you know, the FDIC put into place a program to acquire assets, you know, like the um, the, the public-private uh, partnership uh, mechanism that was set up. Now, on the prudential supervisory front, uh, we uh, you know, we also expect you know banking regulators to closely monitor uh, banks. Um, you know, to evaluate that they are both doing what they can to support borrowers uh, and, you know, you know, sort of not, you know, forestalling, you know, precipitous actions, uh, but also operating in a safe and sound manner. Um, so to some extent where the Fed has and the banking regulators have been, you know, relaxing on some uh, supervisory requirements, uh, on other things, um, you know, the oversight uh, can can be uh, more intense. Um, and then, you know, we also note that the uh, the FSOC uh, Financial Stability Oversight Council uh, is meeting again in May. And you know, while in the past uh, FSOC has um, sort of mainly focused on non-bank. You know, systemically important financial institutions. You know, their authority is broader, and yeah, you know, that could be another uh, tool uh, that can be used to address uh, systemic uh, issues. And and they do have, you know, their authority isn't just over, um, you know, to put institutions under uh, some type of supervision. It it, it goes uh, beyond that. So that could be an interesting. Um, area of development. That, that's, that's very helpful, thanks. I mean, I, I agree with all that. I think it's been interesting to see, you know, a lot of attention obviously on the Paycheck Protection Program. Um, and, you know, some of the questions that we've been getting have been around how much uptake there is on these other facilities that the Fed has put in place versus how much of, of um, a function do they serve as just providing a backstop and you know uh, shoring up market confidence um, and I think that's going to be you know an, an interesting issue to sort of uh, track in the next um, uh, period to see you know how active and and how much lending these facilities are actually having to do uh, versus just the fact that they're they're uh, providing confidence to the markets. Uh, take a look and see if there are other Q&As or open it up to people if they have other questions. I don't see anything in the queue. Um, I guess, you know, I'll, I'll just uh, uh, provide a few concluding remarks and then happy to um, end early and give people back some time if there are no questions. But you know, as um, Tim said, I mean, obviously these are challenging times we're living in and uh, while the events are unfolding rapidly and in real time, uh, we expect the federal regulatory response to continue to be rapid and agile as well. Um, you know, the Fed has put out these facilities and announced them uh, quickly. Uh, I think that there is still a lot of um, information that's still to be uh, determined on how they are going to operate. Um, and as we've sort of flagged through this presentation, you know, what the um, ability for the uh, non-US banks in particular to participate through those facilities will be. Um, 
I, I think that again, you know, w the the last financial crisis, while not um, certainly, you know, uh, uh, exactly what we're dealing with here, is proving to be uh, um, a useful uh, precedent uh, in terms of what the regulators um, are doing and how they are operating, while still um, expanding the scope of what they're doing, uh, particular, you know, in providing assistance to non-financial companies. Um, so with that, you know, we'll uh, uh, be very um, uh, interested to see how this unfolds and obviously, you know, keeping uh, our clients and, and the audience up to date on, on those developments. Uh, Tim, Stephanie, or Bridget, anything else from your ends? This is Bridget. I just want to um, thank you again and um, thank all the members that were able to join. And I repeat, um, Rena's uh, admonition for everyone to please stay safe and uh, feel free to reach out to the IAB or Sherman with questions. Great. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, stay safe. Have a good day.